so I would be lying if um, I said I wasn't completely nervous right now. <laughs> um, so I have everything typed out. I'm still so nervous though, man. <laughs> um, we just got back from our own vacation last week. We were in Crystal Beach. That was fun. I got to fish. I learned how to fish. I don't know if any of you ever fished before, but it's it's a lot harder than it looks. <laughs> I thought you guys just kind of like throw a stick out there and like wait for something to happen. <laughs> so <laughs> it's hard, and it was also a patience lesson too, because they don't. You know, I thought I'd throw it out there. You know, and they'd be like, "Ooh, fighting," but no, no, it was just like sitting there waiting. Like it's something, and then I feel a nibble, right? And I'm like, "Oh my god, something!" And it's just a nibble, and they're like, "No, that's just them eating the bait." And I'm like, "Oh, okay." <laughs> so yeah. Um, yeah, we caught a bunch of sharks. That was cool. We caught, I don't even know how many, ten. like 10 sharks out there. Obviously, we didn't keep them, but yeah, that was, that was a lot of fun. They're, they fight, man. They flop around a lot. <laughs> it was hard. Um, yeah, and as uh, you can tell, our guitarist is also out today, and I'm also leading worship, and which is fine. But um, for these reasons, it is going to be a little bit of a shorter lesson than usual. Um, usually it's supposed to end at 12, but we go over time. But I'm just letting you guys know ahead of time. Um, so with that being said, I guess let's get started on the word. So if you would turn with me to John chapter 2. Um, today, while you're turning there, I just want to talk to you about it before we go into it a little bit. Um, I want to talk to you about success. Um, and basically, <laughs> I've had a lot of conversations with people recently. I've been reconnecting with some of my friends who are off doing things. And um, I've been talking to even people here. And it seems like there's a lot of seemingly like failures in their life. They're not getting to where they want to be. They're not passing the programs and they're not getting into what they want to get into. Or maybe, you know, uh, trips are getting canceled. You know, family members are getting sick. Um, people are hurting, um, and it's crazy how this all lined up because I started planning this before I talked, I spoke with those people, and before I started noticing things. So um, a common thing that I noticed among all of them is they told me that they were discouraged because of the failure that they were seeing, um, and, and most of these people I talked to were, were Christians, and you know, Everyone wants to see a victory. Everyone wants their questions answered. Everyone wants a miracles. Everyone wants to see their promises fulfilled. They're waiting on something. Um, but the truth is that their version of what success looks like is going to be different than how it's outlined in the Bible. And um, studying this hit me hard, too, because there's a difference between worldly success, what the world defines as what is good for you, and what God says is good for you, biblical success. Um, one of the main things that I notice, especially, this is just for me at least, um, I, I try not to stay on social media too much. Um, I do have TikTok deleted because that is like brain rot for me. I will scroll on that forever. So I do have it deleted for a while because I can't do that. But um, I am on like other stuff a little bit. And what I do notice is I find myself seeing people um, having things that I want. And, or, okay, specifically maybe like musicians, you know? I'll see this five-year-old kid who can play this piano really, really well, and I'm like, man, like, what am I doing with my life? You know, like, I'm like twice his age, like, what is he doing? And um, then they have like my dream piano. I've always wanted um, one of those Nord keyboards, which this, one, this one's good too, but I don't want to geek out on you guys, but a Nord keyboard is my dream keyboard. And so I see, I see people playing it, and I'm just like, man, like they've got it going. Like they're on top of the game. And if you look at any of those big worship bands that, and you see the red keyboard, that's what that keyboord is, and it's a Nord. And again, I'm not going to bore you with the details, but basically you can do anything you want on that thing, but it's like really expensive. So I am, I have been saving up, but I, I do find myself comparing myself to other musicians, comparing myself to other Christians. Um, and not even, even in, in that sense, you know, maybe I'll get on social media or I'll watch a video and, um, social media will tell us that we're supposed to look a certain way, you know, that, uh, there are certain beauty standards for both men and for women. You know, there's this peak version of physical fitness that we're supposed to attain in order to have a successful life. Or, you know, we're supposed to have a house and uh, kids and stuff by a certain age. There are certain landmarks that you're supposed to do things. And if you don't hit that landmark, especially at my age, you feel like you're kind of behind on life. You know, I, all of my friends, they're off doing their thing. 
And I found myself, you know, comparing myself to them. And they talked to me, and they were comparing themselves to me. And I was like, why, why do we do this, you know? Um, I do think social media does have a lot to do with it. And it's not that it's bad. I'm not saying so. social media is the devil, because I do hear people preaching that. And it's not the devil. It's just it can be used for good. But a lot of the times it is used for bad. It is used to spread, you know, people maybe flaunting. And there's a difference between flaunting and then like innocently posting what you think is should be shared. You know, I think um, a lot of that kind of distorts our version of what success looks like. Um, so what we see, what we see on these social media apps, uh, we see that life or maybe we see that for me, that keyboard or, you know, we see certain things, you know, certain things that they have that we don't. And we want that life for ourselves, And we see that in our friends and family. We want that life for ourselves. So maybe as a Christian, we will ask God for something like that. We will maybe bargain or maybe we'll say, you know, God, this I want that. This is good for me. I need this in my life. And so because of your distorted version of what victory looks like, that that looks like a victory to you. And so you ask God for a victory. You ask God for um, to him for him to promise you something. You say, God, I'll, I'll do this if you if you'll give me that one thing in my life. I have to have this in order to do this. Now, I've been on the praise team for a while, and um, honestly, I used to do this too, where I used to be like, um, I used to see these other bands, and I, I'm just putting this into my, to my perspective, but I used to see other, ba other bands, and they were big, and they had like real drums and a drummer. Our band is the only one I've seen do this, play like this, okay? So, um, which isn't a bad thing at all, but I do see full bands, and I see five, six, seven Nord keyboards stacked on top of each other. I'm like, man, if we just had that, our worship would be spectacular. You know, if we just had like a full chorus, a full like four or five singers up here, you know, our worship would be spectacular. You know, God give us that victory. I'm waiting for that victory. Um, but the truth is what I had to learn, I learned this a while back, is that um, we, don't, we don't need those instruments for God to move. They didn't have that hundreds of years ago. They didn't have that years ago. They didn't have all of this equipment, you know? They weren't praying to God for a drummer. They were praying for God to move in their church. And that's what we, well, that's what we find ourselves caught up in, is the material aspect of it. So God has a different version of what success is. God tells us what he be believes holds true significant value in John chapter 2 verse 15 through 16. It says, do not love this world nor the things it offers you for when you love the world you do not have the love of the Father in you. For the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see and pride in our achievements and possessions. These are not from the Father, but are from this world, and this world is fading away along with everything that people crave. But anyone who does what pleases God will live forever. So this passage covers everything that we might be tempted to believe will bring us success. I like what it says is um, not only physical pleasure, but a craving for everything we see. We see it. We like it. We want it. Not to quote Ariana Grande, but we do. We really want it. Uh, we see that. We're like, oh, man, that'd be so cool. If I had that, my life would be perfect. Well, let's say we get that, right? So we get that object. And then, and then we find another one. It's like, I need that. I'll get that, and my life will be perfect. And we'll never find fulfillment. You'll never stop because it's all just material pleasures. It's all worldly gain. But the scripture says that anyone who does what pleases God will live forever. That is, that was insane to me. It says, um, Jesus actually says, I don't know if I had, I don't know if I gave this to you. If not, I am so sorry. But um, the gain of this world is not a mark of true success because godly success is found in Luke ten twenty. Also, when Jesus says, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in the book of life. So ultimate success is being saved and knowing God. It is knowing without a doubt that you will be in heaven after this life and that you were called for a greater purpose on earth than to fulfill your humanly desires. That's good. So that was just my little introduction because that's not even what I have to say today. <laughs> um, 
What I want to talk about, I want to mention something that I've noticed is a trend in the Bible. If you've ever picked up a Bible and read maybe one or two stories, you, you notice this sort of trend. Now, if you're a worldly person, you'll see it as, you'll see the kingdom of God as sort of a backwards kingdom. You know, the first will be last, and that doesn't, that doesn't make sense to people. But I notice in a lot of stories, uh, God, God will choose the weak. God will choose the unlikely one. He'll choose the outcasts to make his power known. So that people will know it, they don't rely on human strength. Their strength comes, it's divine intervention. Nothing else could explain this but our God. And um, I, I think of Samson at his weakest with his hair cut and his eyes gouged out. That's when he was at his strongest because he, used, he relied on God's power. Um, he saw the most victory in that moment. And Esther, the Jewish maiden, became the queen of Persia and rescued her people by the grace of God. None of this was planned. None of these people had this in mind, but that was godly success. Yes. Now I want to mention Samson again, what he looked like. Uh, we see that picture of Samson, and we see him with the, with the temple, and he's, you know, he's holding it. But if you look, you know, his, his eyes, they didn't, they took him out, they cut his hair. It's all, it's all in that song, <laughs> you know? <laughs> you know, everyone knows the song. Uh, yeah, it was so, to, to a human eye, he, he looked like, they, they were actually, they brought him there for entertainment, to, to mock him and make fun of him because for what they did to him. Um, so that worldly, that worldly view looked like he was losing, but, but God had another idea because he doesn't look at the outward appearance, he looks at the heart. And Samson was a man who was faithful to God. Um, oh, that's another one. King David. Everyone knows King David. King David was the youngest of all his brothers. And uh, the, they were trying to see which one would be the, uh, the new king, the future king, I believe. They were going to anoint him. And it was believed that his oldest brother, I, I don't remember the oldest brother's name, but it was believed that his oldest brother, who was more attractive, who was stronger, uh, to, to the human eye, he was more suitable to be king than little old David, right? But when they saw David, um, God told Samuel in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7, this is about his brother, it says, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. And I remember reading that David was a man after God's own heart. This is the biblical trend, that the weak will be shown as strong through Christ because they have a heart after God. They were pursuing God. They were obedient to God. So ultimately revealed in all of these stories is that first, biblical success will not look like worldly success. The world teaches you that if it is pleasurable, it must be good for you. They teach you that you are the ruler of your own life. That if I say this is good for me, then it's good for me. And doesn't this kind of sound like Eve in the garden? Where God told her, hey, don't, don't eat this fruit. The, you know, he, he literally gave her clear-cut instructions. You could not misunderstand it. And she still, she still was tempted, and she ate the fruits, the forbidden fruit. And that is a lot like how we see what we want in our lives and we see that and we think it's good for us but we don't ever stop and pray and ask God God is this what you want for me like it looks tempting it looks really really nice but you know I think it would be good for me but you know better than I do God is goodness God is intelligence God is love and he only wants the best for you but the world doesn't <laughs> the world wants what's best for the world it's a it's a greedy it's a greedy world. It's they value power, they value money, they value status. But if you look at Jesus, Jesus looked he was he was unlikely by the human eye to be the son of God because he came in, he dressed very humbly. He came in on a donkey. He was born in a manger. People thought that he would be coming in magnificently, maybe on like a really tall horse, maybe with like swords and shields and because that's what that was back then. Kings were very 
almost worshipped. They were very highly respected. And um, Jesus did not fit the human mold for what we thought a son of God would look like. That's the ultimate, that's the supreme example of the backwards kingdom that the heaven of God looks like to the outside world. Um, the second thing is, um, this is the main thing that I want to talk about, is how to obtain that kind of biblical success. And I believe that it is outlined in Hebrews chapter 12. So while you turn there, I want to give you context for the book of Hebrews. Um, right. So Hebrews uh, can ultimately be described as a testament to the superiority of Jesus. Um, it was written for Christians who were very weak. They were being persecuted at this time. A lot of Christians were being tortured and killed. Uh, this was after, uh, this was years after Pentecost, but those people who worshipped came back uh, and were received with the Holy Spirit. They went back to their homes and um, they came, some of them, you know, came to Rome and this is where this is because those, stor those Christians um, who had the Holy Spirit were spreading the gospel, but it didn't go very well for them. They faced many, many, many grave hardships, and they were being killed for their beliefs very, very brutally. Um, before 12, I want to read. I didn't give this to you, RJ, because I'm just going to read it. Uh, it says, Others were tortured, refusing to turn from God in order to be set free. They placed their hope in a better life after the resurrection. Some were jeered at, and their backs were cut open with whips. Others were chained in prisons. Just to be clear, these are Christians. These are Christians. Some died by stoning. Some were sawed in half, and others were killed with the sword. Some went about wearing skins of sheep and goats, destitute and oppressed and mistreated. They were too good for this world, wandering over deserts and mountains, hiding in caves and holes in the ground. All these people earned a good reputation because of their faith, yet none of them received all that God had promised. For God had something better in mind for us, so that they would not reach perfection without us. God, God had something better in mind. That doesn't look like success. If you see people, they, they saw the Christians being tortured and killed, and they're like, okay, yeah, they're losing. But how can that be winning in God's eyes? How can it be winning that Jesus was murdered and tortured and hanging on a cross? Because in that moment, it looked like he was losing. It looked like he was defeated. But again, this is that biblical trend. This is that backwards kingdom where Christ was resurrected and he ended up beating death after death. That is, that's the power of the cross. That's the power of Jesus. And when we submit ourselves to this power, people wonder why. People wonder why our lives are going so well. And they wonder, they ask you, what's your secret? And you can tell them with confidence that I put my hope in the Lord and I obey the words of this Bible because they are life and they do lead me to where I have to go. So, the outline. This is, um, I'll just read the first couple of verses. It says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up, and let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith because of the joy awaiting him. He endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he is seated in the place of honor besides God's throne. So, this is the outline. The first one they noticed. Um, it says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, I think this is important in stripping off all the sin, all the weight that's going to weigh us down, uh, is having that huge crowd of witnesses. Um, I told you earlier about Jerry. She did tell me. She told me this all before she left. Um, you know, do it scared. I was scared to audition for... Um, a music minor at school. I was very nervous, but she said, do it scared, you know? And it's really, it's helped me so much because I am scared of a lot. I am scared to talk to people. I'm scared to get up in front of people and talk. <laughs> <laughs> I am scared of a lot, <laughs> but it stuck with me and I do use it every day. Do it scared, you know? I'm so blessed to have the best people in my life. 
I have the best, I have the best parents who have helped me. They've guided me in this journey so far and I've got the best church around me. I'm looking around at all these people and all these faces and I know that you have all helped me through some really, really tough times and I do thank you for that. Um, I've got really good friends that you know I've cried with, that I've prayed with, people who've prayed over me. Uh, Miss, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm gonna call you guys out, but my mom and Miss Tina Stelly over there, they used to pray for boldness for me, like every day, all the time, they would pray for me to be bold because I used to come turn down my volume and not speak at all, and I was really shy, but, and I still am, <laughs> but um, at Discovery Camp, I was able to, to give that up, and I don't want fear to control my life anymore. I, I decided to put that aside and I decided to let the Holy Spirit work through me because all I have to do is show up. He's going to show out. He does the hard, he does the heavy lifting, you know? Um, so that's my first point is to surround yourself with like-minded Christians who only want what's best for you, who only want to see you succeed and help you in further advancing the kingdom of God. This is so important. I learned this also at Discovery Camp, uh, Pastor Rachel Birchfield. She said, friends are like elevators. They'll either take you up or down. And it's, it's simple, but it is so true. It is so true that there, who you hang out with is who you are, by an extension of who you are. You know, I, I don't mean this to say don't, don't let Jesus, you know, don't hide Jesus in yourself from people who you don't think um, you should be associating with because Jesus associated with everyone in order to show that light. But keep your friends very, very close to your heart and rely on them. Be careful who, what I'm trying to say is, be careful who you share your life with and be careful who you get your advice from. Seek, it says to seek wise counsel. Yes. So remember, who you're, fe who you're feeding into is different from who pours into you. There is a difference. So surround yourself with like-minded people who only want to see you succeed. And the second one, we uh, must strip off every weight that slows us down. This is drop dropping activities that bring you away from your relationship with Jesus. This is dropping sin, and it is not hard to do, especially if you have maybe an addiction to something. It is not hard to do. I mean, it is not easy to do. It is not an easy thing to do. Um, I, yeah, I, I do understand that. There's a lot of, there's a lot that goes on. It, you may have an emotional, physical, or a psychological like attachment to something, and it's, it is really hard to break. So it is a lot easier said than done, but God, God can do it. Um, you, what you, okay. I'm so sorry. I'm stuttering. <laughs> um, what you have to do, I would say, is pray, pray to God very diligently. You, so you seek your friends, ask them to pray for you. But it's also important that you seek the face of God yourself. So, um, if you struggle with something. The first step is to acknowledge that you struggle with it. And I would pray for conviction. I would pray that God would search. You, you should pray to God for him to search your heart for anything that um, anything that you might not even know that, that uh, is bringing you away from your relationship to God. Um, he, will make, he will make it known. The Holy Spirit will make it known. Um, most importantly, though, this is what strengthens your relationship with God. Uh, because through through suffering, through having these problems, and by having God overcome them, you you learn to rely on Him a little bit more. But I did write down a prayer that I think was uh, is really helpful, and um, I said, okay, I would pray this prayer, right? I would say, God, I ask that you search my heart and bring to my attention anything that is displeasing to you, any activity or habit that I have. Please make me aware of it so that I may repent and know you more fully. Um, the final step is over here, verse, it's still in verse 2. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. So 
keeping our eyes on Jesus. Once we receive that conviction, we have to admit that we struggle with that sin. And this is where we can rely on those that community of people to help pray for you and to help you overcome that burden. Um, and again, this strengthens your relationship with God. It makes you realize that you really do need Him in your life. And this is how lives become testimonies and how holy living is witnessed by others. And it, it's encouragement for them to believe too. It's, it goes again, I have people ask me, you know, you seem so put together, like, what are you doing? And I feel like, well, I have no idea what I'm doing with my life. All I know is that I'm following the Bible, you know? I, there is no secret. The secret, I guess, is God, you know? You just follow them, follow the words written in here, and it really is an instruction for how you sh need to live your life, because this instruction is written with love. God is love, and God is goodness, and God is intelligent. And um, I do... Uh, I do want to talk. I do want to talk about uh, what I was mentioning in the beginning was about um, miracles. So by keeping our eyes on Jesus, we are focused on what is ahead of us. We look at what is to come and not on things that have already passed. So once you have been set free, the enemy loves to remind you of who you once were and what you once did. But, um, oh, and that's another thing, he likes to compare you to other people. That's what I did. I used to torture myself comparing myself to, you know, our other praise leader or other people on the team. And it got me nowhere because you're not meant to be like another Christian. We are a body of Christ and a body is full of so many different compartments, so many vital parts of your body that make you who you are, that um, you're able to function in the way that you do. There is not one part that is more significant or less significant. They're all very, very important. And um, the body of Christ is the same way. So uh, don't don't compare yourself. Don't don't compare. Don't even compare yourself to the past you, because you're continually growing and you're continually walking in your journey with Christ. And this is what it means to be a Christian. Um, and these things are also important to remember that biblical success is running the race with endurance and faithfulness to God, not in achievements or wealth. So again, biblical success isn't even having a miracle because we're not entitled to a miracle. We're not entitled to live a perfect life. This, this belief that because I'm a Christian, because I'm born again, I'm gonna see miracles every day of my life, I'm going to walk in perfection, this could not be further from the truth. The truth is this, we should not be seeking miracles, we should be seeking the face of God. Because the word says, those who seek me will find me. Not those who seek miracles will find miracles. It's not those who seek perfection will find perfection. It says, seek God as though you would look for lost treasure. Look for it urgently. Look for it consistently. Look for it diligently. And you will find God. He, he, he doesn't want to hide from you. He wants you to know him. He wants what's good for you. But he wants surrender, too. He wants your heart. It's not a one-way relationship, and you don't get to ask him for a miracle when things get bad. It's a relationship just like you call your friend every day, or you call your girlfriend, boyfriend every day, or husband, wife. You should talk to God above all of these relationships. This should be an everyday, constant communication with God. And know that he knows what's best for you. And maybe a miracle isn't what's best. Maybe there is going to be suffering. There is going to be trial and tribulation, just like the Christians in the book of Hebrews. They were tired, and this was a letter of encouragement to them because they were being persecuted, and they were ready to give up. They were, they were, they were on the brink. But it says, Think of all the hostility that Jesus endured from sinful people. Then you won't become weary and give up. After all, you have not give, yet given your lives in your struggle against sin. So your race is still going. You are still fighting, and the end isn't over yet. God can still make a move. Mm. A faith based on miracles is not a mature faith. If you have to see the other side of the promise to know that God is good, you're going to be susceptible to deception. You're going to be susceptible for the enemy to come in with his lies and say, you know what? God hasn't moved when you thought he was going to move. Maybe he's not going to move at all. Maybe, maybe you don't deserve this miracle, and that's why God's not giving it to you. Faith like that is very dangerous to have. Your faith is in God and God alone and his timing alone. What you are going to receive in your life, if you pray that it's from God, it will be good. 
and it will be on the exact time that you need it. He says, blessed are you who have faith without even seeing. There was a soldier who went up to Jesus and asked him to heal his, was it servant or son? I'm going off my notes here. He asked him to heal and he was like, well, I'm not, I'm not even there. I'm not even with him. This is when Jesus was beginning to perform miracles. And um, the soldier was like, yeah, but you're, you're the son of God. You can snap your fingers and you can say, you can say the word from right here and it's done. And he said, I haven't seen faith like this in all of Israel. So because he had faith, he received that miracle. He wasn't entitled to it, but because he had that faith in God, Jesus, he saw that it was, it was good. It is said that um, King David was chosen to be king because he was af a man after God's own heart. So remember that biblical success is running the race with endurance, our eyes always fixated not on ourselves, not on success, and not on failure, but on advancing the kingdom of God. Um, I hear people say that if Abraham is the same God that we worship, why don't we see miracles that Abraham saw? I've heard this very recently, and I've also heard this over years. You know, why don't we see maybe what Moses saw? Why don't we see what Samson and Esther, and even Jesus, why don't we see what Jesus saw back then? All those, all those miracles, all of these miracles, everything written in here, why don't we see stuff like that anymore? And something that a good friend of mine told me a while back um, said that if you want to see what Jesus saw, you have to do what Jesus did. If you want to see what Moses saw, you have to have faith like Moses did. And if you want victory like Samson, you have to rely on God like Samson did. God wants you to win, but his version of winning won't look like what you have in mind. It's not going to look like it's some perfect plan. It is a perfect plan from God, but it's not going to be a perfect plan to you. There will be suffering and there will be trials and tribulations because that's what's going to bring you closer to God. It's going to make you realize, you know, I thought I could do this on my own, but I, I don't know. I have no idea what I'm doing. I'm not strong enough to do this. God, I need you. This is what brings us to prayer, and it's what brings us to our knees. And this is, once we have that coming to Jesus moment, we need to continue that throughout the rest of our lives, and we need to apply it to every area of our lives. And I'm going to close um, with this. I want to illustrate something for you. So, um, you can come up. Yeah. And you can do the thing. Um, yeah, so summer break. I actually don't have classes. I am in college right now. I'm a junior now. And my major is psychology. I've taken a lot of classes that were really cool. And I've also taken a lot of classes that I thought that I would never need in my life because like, why did we need to learn all of that? And it was just so boring, but we had to do it anyway. Um, but yeah, I am studying psychology. So with psychology, you know, you have to take a lot of, well, for me, I took a lot of biology classes. And I learned things that I never thought that I'd use again. But I do want to teach you a little bit about what I have learned. Um, do you have the picture ready? The first one that I gave you? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So y'all know what this is, right? Do y'all know what this is? It's DNA, right. Um, so biology, for those of you who don't know, biology is the study of life, and there isn't a more fascinating subject for those who want to study the handiwork of God. This makes me so excited because this, this is my, <laughs> this is my thing right here. Um, so I did want to start with DNA, and uh, the picture doesn't show it very clearly, but it is made of, uh, see all those little things on there, it's all, it's so intricate. This, I'm not going to give you a science lesson, but I do want to show you the intricacy of our design. And this is, at its very, very basic, basic form, this is who we are. And it's a double helix right here. If you look on the outside, it's made up of all those molecules. And if you've ever heard of the compounds that come together, it's adenine, thymine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. It's been a minute, y'all. Um, but those uh, pairs come together. And this is basically what codes are 
it's our genetic coding. It's, the, it's responsible for our hair color, our eye color, our skin color, our height, and this is, this is what we inherit from our parents, and this is what's passed down, and this is why um, we act, look, this is, this is the reason that we are the way that we are. Um, the next picture I want to show you is my forte because I am a psychology major, so I do know a lot about this. This one may be a little bit harder, but um, we have a lot of cells in our body, and those cells contain our DNA. And there are different types of cells everywhere. You have stomach cells, skin cells, blood cells. Um, this specifically is a brain cell, also called a neuron. And basically, in its most basic form, this is the little body up there, and those are the uh, those are the dendrites that receive the information. This is the axon, and those are the little terminals down there that are going to give the information away. And once all of these are lined up, and of course there are different types, but it's most basic form. Um, once all of these are lined up, those are what sends the neurotransmitters, and this is what's responsible for how our brain works. Um, I'm not going to get into a neurochemistry class right now, but there are different there are different kinds of uh, chemicals and there are different kinds of neurons that interact with each other. And if you've ever seen a real one, which I had, I got to see a real one, and it was the coolest freaking day of my life. We were in uh, we were in a lab, and I got to see real neurons. And the way that they were interacting it was like this really deep, complicated. It was like a spider web. You know how you look outside, and it's like those stars are up there. That's what you see down there. But they're all interconnected, and the way that it looks like absolute chaos, but in reality, it's serving its function per like perfectly. It's all perfectly designed. It's all greatly designed, and it all points to a great designer. It could have only been done by a great designer, an intelligent designer. So show them the last picture. Yeah, I thought that this was really interesting. I don't know if, I don't know who made this, but um, if you've ever looked up and seen the stars at night. I do love a very starry night. I, I like the clear sky and it's hard <laughs> to see where we live with all the lights and everything but um, we went to Colorado a few years ago and I, I remember just looking up and seeing like how clear it was. It was beautiful and looking at the, the actual mountain that was in front of me and not just on a computer screen and looking at the trees that I was surrounded with and I just it almost brought me to tears that, that my God would make this but care about me so much more. <laughs> That this isn't even a portion of what God has made for us. You can't even see the earth in that. And if you were to see the earth, you couldn't even see us. And then I think back to the neurons, and I think back to the cells, and the DNA that makes us who we are. And My point of showing you all of this is that it is intricately designed. It is designed very intelligently, and it is designed with care. So don't tell me that God is not real and that he's not here and that he's not alive and that he doesn't care about every aspect of your life because he knows the numbers on, of hairs on your head and he knows the types and how many cells that are in your body and he cares about making them work and he cares about how we work and he cares about what's going on in your life and he wants you to talk to him so badly and if he cares to make that beauty and if he cares to make all these beautiful animals and those beautiful trees and these beautiful huge mountains and oceans he cares for us so much more and that blows me away this is what I want to close with this is what I want to close with you can but <laughs> I'm shaking I get so excited it's
miracle still happens, and if it's in God's will, it will get done. This is another thing a friend told me, a really good friend of mine. He said, our Father God is too great and big and strong and mighty and powerful and intelligent. And you are too small and weak compared to him to mess up whatever plans he has for your life. Isn't that reassuring? That this is the nature of Christianity, that he, he knows we're weak. He knows that we don't know what he knows. He knows that we don't share his mind. We couldn't comprehend the mind of God. We try to find, we find ourselves bargaining with him. Now when I say him, I want you to remember the guy. We argue with the guy who created this and the guy who created the, the DNA. Individual, because all of our DNA is different. Every single one of us, it is unique to me. Even twins have unique DNA. This is fascinating. He, he made all of this and we have the audacity to maybe bargain with him or argue with him or say, you know what, I think, I think, I think this is what I need in my life. I, th I need this for success, you know? But he's saying, he's trying to grab you by your shoulders and saying, no, like, I have a perfect design. You just have to trust me. You just have to follow me and that's it. That's all we have to do. All we have to do is praise. So, I wanted to end with this song. And we'll pray us out and we'll be dismissed but I really want you to take time to sing this song, not only with your mouth and with your words, but cry out and sing it with your heart to the creator of everything. To the creator of everything that you see is good and beautiful.